All right, hi everyone. Um, so first off, thank you so much to um, Lily and Adam for organizing this um, and inviting me to share a couple of thoughts. Um, thanks so much also for the venue. This is really nice. And yeah, thank you for everyone for coming out here. Um, so today I'm gonna share a couple of lessons that I've learned throughout my startup experiences as an MLE. Um, the disclosure today is that I will not be talking about my current employer or my past employers. Okay, do not take it as investment advice or any outlook. So I think I should be good on the legal front right there. Okay, so there are two things I wanna to do today. First, I want you to convince you why is quality assurance so important and how you can do it easily zero to one for your particular application. So that's my first job today. My second job is to provide you with three templates, so two, three, and four, of things that hopefully you can take home, implement in the software that you're building, um, or save it as knowledge for later when you might have to use it. So I had a really long title. Um, we're gonna first scope out what are we actually talking about? What are we not talking about? Okay, so that's the title. I had a really hard time trying to make this short. Robust production, quality assurance practices, for multi-model systems and shifting ground truth and UX environments. Okay, so it's super long, <laughs> let's break it down. Okay, production theory practices. Basically, our goal is to prevent prolonged periods of downtime or bugs in production, okay? Every system is prone to production issues and there are solutions that exist in all parts of the stack, not just in production. So you have to be very strategic and deliberate about where you put these quality checks in. Multi-model systems, um, I also just realized, maybe just Okay, an engineer does not know how to fix an engineering problem, but um, multimodal systems. So, right, we've all done sort of like in college, you build a model and that predicts if it's a cat or a dog. That's not how the real world usually operates. You usually have a lot more complicated systems where you have ML models in sequence. So you have model, put in some input, output comes out, you put into another model, take that output, put into another model. And if you have some error downstream, now you have to figure out where in the world the error is upstream, and that can be a hassle. Now, the second flavor of this is if you have independent models, but they're all acting on the same object. So if you're talking about maybe an assistant AI that uses NLP, maybe it says a whole bunch of different things, but they're different sort of intent tags everywhere. One thing goes wrong, you have to figure out which model caused that. Okay, the most important one is shifting ground truth and UX. So in today's age, I think there are a lot more amazing products that are out there that really revolve um, around the product experience. And what I mean here is that the user experience uh, stitches multiple objects together to produce an experience. That's what's blocked right there. Okay, so you'll see this in language, feed ranking, recommendation applications. I'll go through an example. So imagine an AI assistant, okay, responding to, I'd like to book a tour Thursday afternoon, okay? So maybe your original test, right, your ground truth test says, okay, we have scheduled your tour on Thursday at 2.30 p.m. at Avalon Midtown West. So it's an okay answer, right? But a week goes by and you get some customer complaints. Which Thursday? Is it this Thursday? Is it next Thursday? Is it Thursday a month later when the person says, I'm going to be in town, can I come then? So maybe you decide, okay, the user experience should be different. We want to say Thursday, August 4th, the specific day. Now you might have this come up again and you have a customer complaint saying this is super impersonal, like we're not retaining prospective renters and the apartment complexes that are using the software are not happy. Now we want to say, okay, we'll add, please note that social distancing is highly encouraged and that we sanitize our spaces daily. We look forward to having you. So it becomes a lot more personal. Okay, so these examples are like pretty innocent and straightforward, but it actually makes, uh, you're testing a lot more complicated. So whenever the user experience changes from Thursday to Thursday, August 4th, you don't just have regression testing. You also need to update your ground truth test. So this is the framework that you're all probably familiar with. You have some model in development, you want to productionize it. You have some tests. If the tests pass, you deploy the model. If the tests don't pass, something's wrong with the model, you fix it, repeat the process, and then independently, you might add new tests as they come up. Whenever you have this UX change, um, now you have these two orange objects too. If a test fails, maybe that's actually expected behavior. Maybe we do want to say Thursday, August 4th now, right? So you need to have some way of being able to easily identify when is that failure actually expected? And if it is expected, how can you regenerate the test in an easy way? Okay, 
So that's the complication in these products that are like AI assistance for real estate, or you have um, feed recommendations where you have certain rules about how you can't have posts by the same user uh, from your same friend three times in a row, or we don't want to show you three videos in a row, right? So the key point, UX updates will always change the ground truth and force updates to the testing suite. Manual updates are super painful, right? We've all done it. We've all gone into tests and like literally copy paste like changes in the code. Um, and having some form of automation can be really valuable. Okay, but it's not easy, right? You're basically trying to pin down a moving target all the time. So is it worth it to actually do this? Maybe it's not worth it. Our system just changes. We don't need that quality assurance. So we're gonna do a fun little live poll right now. Okay, show of hands, how many of you have been in meetings about doing e-tests for your software? So show of hands, how many of you have been in rooms where you've been with engineers and you're thinking, do I need tests? Okay, great, keep, keep your hands up. All right, we're gonna filter you down little by little. All right, keep your hand up if the conclusion of that meeting was we don't need tests, we don't need to build those tests yet. So put your hand down if the decision was we're going to actually implement those tests and you implemented the test. Okay, I saw like five hands go down. Okay, so we're still strong. Okay, keep your hand up if within three months of that meeting about we don't need tests, tests were actually still created because you needed them. Like the situation was so bad, you just needed them. So keep your hand up if that's the case, put your hand down if you didn't need a test. Okay, so I saw maybe three or four hands. Okay, so we still saw a number of us with our hands up. I guarantee you there probably was someone difficult in that meeting because I've been through this experience at every single one of my startups. So probably the argument came up in this form, right? Move fast and break things, which ironically is also a Facebook idiom. Um, but for me, this is how I feel about this particular phrase. Okay. Sometimes when we want to move fast and break things, we just like completely break the system in a way where it just doesn't help anyone out. Like dude's laptop is not working. Um, also in my mind, this is kind of emotionally how I feel when I hear this statement. Um, it's very similar to data-driven insights. I feel like people just gather whatever data and make a conclusion, but like if your data is biased, if it's not good, if your analysis is wrong, like your decision is terrible, right? So similarly, I have feelings about this phrase. So here's how I would phrase this adage, and hopefully um, this might be helpful for some of you who are thinking about quality assurance. Um, move fast and break things and have efficient tools to fix broken things quickly, okay? So you still wanna iterate quickly in development, that's the entire spirit of this phrase, but you don't wanna leave production in a bad state for long when you have customers and busy engineers. And the emphasis is on overall speed in prod and dev, right? Moving fast doesn't mean you get something into production. It also is, hey, I'm developing things and I'm not fixing things in prod all the time. And then the other thing that I've also observed is um, testing is not the antithesis of moving fast. A lot of people can play that and it really gets to me. So a lot of people say, oh, we don't need full coverage. That's not your objective. Your objective is to make sure the user experience is good. You wanna make sure to test, you test basically the user objects that they interact with. So you should focus on end-to-end -end testing. Don't focus about coverage. So some people say, we don't need tests because we don't need coverage. That's not the mentality. The other one is don't conflate speed with efficacy. So some of it's, some of the experiences that I've had were, okay, we don't need tests, we need to move fast, we need to just code and you know push these things to prod. Um, and everyone is supposed to run north. But what happens is if you have some form of QA, and if you're, I don't know why this was the case, but in one of my experiences, we, we were so adverse to writing like a one-page design document, right? If you don't have those things, people are gonna run really fast, northwest and northeast, and you don't get to north quickly enough together collectively as a group. Okay, so the other thing that I've kind of learned from my experiences is you don't want to conflate speed with efficacy, like have some decent form of like a half page doc just to align people, right? You're not trying to write a 300 page novel. That's not what we're asking you to do. Um, that one's blocked off, but it's okay. Um, I also hear some people say, oh, if you're a good engineer, you don't need tests. Okay, first of all, every single person who said that to me, I've seen them in a situation where they spend one or two days just trying to fix a prod bug. Okay, so first of all, don't listen to those people. Like we're all good engineers, but we're not perfect. And even if you are one of those like rare exceptional engineers, at some point you're gonna be working in someone else's code base, right? And you're not gonna know what's happening in that code base. You need some kind of quality assurance to make sure, you know, that whatever you put in production isn't buggy. 
So that's my spiel. Okay, just wanted to condense some years of experience for you. Um, so production fires will always happen, but you you can't control that. But you can control the time it takes for you to fix your system. Okay, so here I'm going to share a couple of um, templates that you can take home with you. Okay, just really easy zero to one templates that you can adjust for your needs. Um, so I took those items two, three, and four and put them in different parts. So you can think about when you're developing your model or pipeline, you want to be very, very deliberate about how you tag your metadata. Okay, pre-deployment checks, we're going to talk about the two orange um, objects, right? We want to have good regenerative testing. And then lastly, once your model's out in prod, make sure you have some easy rollback mechanism. Now, this there's so much more to this, right? In production, right, and post-deployment. So one thing I've done a lot of is bias mitigation, explainability, um, data drift anomaly detection. You want those things, but you also want to have just like a big red button to say, hey, production's broken, please revert back to the previous state of the system where it's fine. So these are just basic sort of foundational things. Of course, there are other things, but I just wanted to start with this for you all. Okay, okay metadata tagging. So focus on what the user interacts with. So user experience, right? The user interacts with some objects and those objects are affected by services, models, and model artifacts, right? And you can tag your objects based on what's coming out of these, right? So there's service, maybe you have some kind of prediction service that generates a response to um, the renter um, in the AI example that I'm using. Um, there are a couple of models, they produce a couple of artifacts and those artifacts affect the final object that's given back to the user. So you have to decide what it looks like in your use case. I'll just give you some high level examples of what I've seen. So maybe someone says, hi, I'm looking for one bedroom units. Uh, can I bring my reptile with me? And then we tagged artifacts, breeding intent. They say, hi, availability. I'm looking for one bedroom units, pet policy intent, reptile, right? And those tags come from two models. There's an intent extractor and a one word extractor because um, maybe in the previous iteration, we didn't pick up reptile as a pet. Right, we only know cats and dogs. Reptile is just not in our data set. So we had to build an extra model. And then that comes from service parse user request. Okay, so that's just one example. You can also have the situation where you tag individual um, objects with one-on-one -on -one mappings with tags. They all still come from, there's a line here that talks about models, that's blocked. <laughs> and then it comes from service dialogue generation. Okay. So here's why tagging is so important. It's mainly for this point right here. It's for your testing framework. So reminder, we have to do these two things. We have to figure out if the changes in the UX are valid. And if they are, we have to have an easy way of updating our tests that's painless and doesn't waste time for your engineers. Okay, so a couple of um, guiding principles. It should be easy to find which model update caused a breaking change. You get that by good tagging, what we just talked about. If you tag very deliberately, it'll make this so much easier for you. The second one is to have some easy way of examining objectives for failed tests. Um, you need some kind of good UI tool. And I'm not talking about building like a React application, like literally just pretty print um, in your terminal, like the results of the test. It can be that simple. And the last thing, it should be easy to update the tests with a single command or a call, right? You don't want to go in and copy paste uh, Tuesday, August 4th in all the places such as say Tuesday. Okay, so for those two orange boxes, here are kind of the designs for those. Um, so let's talk about examining object diffs for failed tests. You have a test, there's an input, there's an output. You have some sequence of models that you want to put into production. Okay, so again, stressing the fact that often it's not just a single model that predicts cat dog. It's like a sequence of models that you know extracts the tense, generates a response, uh, maybe has like some one word classifiers. So key point here is it can be whatever. It can be multiple models here. Now the output comes out, it has these tags that we talked about. You take the test output, which is also tagged, and then you have some kind of lightweight diff viewer. Okay, so we'll get to this one. This is the hard part of this. Now, let's just say in the diff viewer, you see, okay, test is failing, but the user experience is correct. I need to update my tests. You just simply take the output that you have and just overwrite your test and persist it. And you can streamline that, have some kind of method or API that just takes in model IDs, a test ID, I um, mean, you just hit the button there and it regenerate the test for you. And it's good to go for the next time you have to test it. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a diff viewer example. Um, this one's pretty involved. And I just wanna show you sort of um, why it's important to even do all these things because 
we only have four statements here and it already gets super messy. Okay. So here's the original test output. I'll get I'll go back to it. Here's the proposed test output from the new models. I've underlined things that have changed. Super unreadable, right? Okay, when you create your diff viewer, literally just have the object and then put the diffs, print out the diffs based on what's added and what's removed. So let's work through this example. So it looks like the B1 object. So let's go back. B1 is hello, our one bedroom units start at 3,100. Will you be available for a tour? Okay, and A1, so B is the AI, A is the renter, perspective renter. Hi, I'm looking for one bedroom units this fall. Can I bring my reptile with me? Okay, so let's see what we're changing. So, okay, we have content. We allow dogs up to 40 pounds, et cetera. Um, it looks like we're adding the pet policy, right? And it looks like we have this new model, single word classifier, and this weird thing about dialogue generation that we'll come back to in a moment. So if I go back, okay, that makes sense. They're asking about reptiles and we are not giving them a pet policy, right? And of course, this is not, not perfect because we don't talk about reptiles, but at least we picked up that they're talking about animals. So that looks good to me. Let's go to B2. Okay, so we're saying we offer tours on Thursday uh, from that time to that time with 2 p.m. work. And we've removed, we have scheduled your tour on Thursday. Okay, looks like, okay, we're basically adding an offer for tour times um, and we're removing um, a scheduled tour basically. Um, and we have this dialogue generation version update again. So let's go back and see what happens. So originally person says, could I come by on a Thursday? We have scheduled your tour. Okay, so that's bad, right? They're asking if they can come by on Thursday and we're just like, boom, you better come at this time. What's more reasonable is we ask them, we are available at this time, what would work for you, right? So that makes sense to me. And then now if I go back to this, okay, that makes sense. We're not introducing a new model. What's happening is the backend code is actually changing to make sure that whenever we see this case for requesting a tour, we always like say, what time would you like to come in? Not just, you must come in at this time. So that makes sense. It's coming from the back end. It's not coming from the model. Okay. So I hope this example was involved enough, right? There are only four lines, but you can already see if you have some kind of complex system that has way more than four, you know, conversation points, it can get really messy really quickly. And having something like this is a godsend. Okay. So that's the summary. Um, sure. I'll go through it. Isolate the fail tests, display the full objects, display just the diffs figure out if there's a regression, repeat until no fail tests, and then you can deploy your model sequence. Okay, production model roll, roll back in. So now we're entering, you know, tests are all good. We've deployed this, um, something might break in production. So here's another question for you all. So show of hands, how many of you have a restorative big red button that restores a broken production state to a previously working state? So what I mean by that is production, and go ahead, you can raise your hands. I'll just clarify what I mean. Um, right. I don't mean you see something is wrong in production, code breaks, some engineer figures out which commit uh, broke that change and reverts that commit. That's very manual. So how many of you have something that's more automated? You just hit the button. So go ahead, raise your hands. Okay, keep your hands high, nice and high. Okay, I want everyone to just look around, look at the number of hands. Okay, so I hope this is going to be helpful for you all. So you all can start thinking about big red buttons. Okay, so the mentality of this is don't let things sit in production. Like, why would you do that? Put the fire out right away. Make sure the experience is okay for the customer and then resolve your issues on the side and redeploy to prod. Like, why, why do you, <laughs> this is something that gets to me in some of my uh, startup experiences. So the other point I want to make that make about this is you want to roll back the entire sequence of models and your code base components, not just individual models. So here's the example. We have sequence zero. There's model A, B, C, and then the repo version for, let's just say that's a semi-per-service that has three models. That's the most recent valid sequence that worked in prod. Let's say you come up with sequence one. So it looks like you updated model one, model B, model C is the same, and then the repo is uh, updated as well. Passes all of the tests you put into prod, now there is a failure. So when that happens, you want to revert the entire sequence, sequence one with sequence zero. We don't know if model A, B, or the repo caused the issue. There's probably some complicated interdependency between them. And you're probably going to waste time trying to roll back things individually, right? Just go ahead, roll back the entire sequence, then figure out the bug afterwards. 
Okay, so here's the design, right? So you have your models in fraud. If you have an infrastructure issue, right, just right away, you can roll back. If you can't get the model from, you know, SageMaker or wherever you've deployed your models, or you can't produce a valid inference, go ahead and roll back to the most recent sequence. Otherwise, your model's producing some good stuff. If there's no bad behavior, you're happy. However, if there's some break in prod or customer reports bad behavior, even if you don't have bugs, you can roll back to sequence like that as well. So think about just developing a method. It doesn't even have to be an API. Just literally develop one method that goes to a database that has your model sequences and then rolls it back. Right. So these are some, you know, high level foundational things. I hope it was helpful. So you can go from being mad and punching through things and moving fast, breaking things fast to I don't know what this guy is doing. He's I, I never see that in the office, but you can be happier, is my point. So don't be mad, get some lightweight QA components. These are um, hopefully pretty easy zero to one projects that you could take on. Hopefully it helps you all in your work and you know, not now, maybe later. And with that, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Well